Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the program on constitu constitutional government. Our, our guest today is Bruce Cole. Bruce Cole is an art historian and also a political man. As an art historian, he was a professor at Indiana University, and he's published books, uh, Sienese Painting and the Age of Renaissance, Titian and Venetian Painting from 1450 to 1590, and The Informed Eye, Understanding Masterpieces of Western Art. But uh, as a political man, he served as chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities from uh, 2001 to 2009 in the George W. Bush administration, and he's now a senior fellow in the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington. His uh, topic today is the Eisenhower Memorial Mess. Thank you, Harvey, and no. thanks everybody for coming. You want me to use the mic? Okay. Um, I'm going to spend about 20 minutes just giving you an a overview of what's going on with the Eisenhower Memorial. I understand this is being videotaped, so um, I can't be entirely candid, but if you want to talk to me afterwards, and I determine you're not wearing a wire, I will, uh, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you. Um, so, um, full disclosure, I am a member of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, which is the federal commission set up to build uh, the memorial I've been on for almost uh, two years. I, my appointment caused great consternation in the commission and the staff because I had been writing um, very critical uh, pieces about the Eisenhower Memorial for several years before that. <coughs> so I am the dissenting member of the commission. Um, everybody else is very much on board, and uh, I'm not. So uh, I want to talk to you really about, it's kind of two parts of this. One is just the kind of aesthetic, uh, historical idea about what a memorial is, and then I want to talk to you about the process of making a memorial uh, on the mall, the whole federal commission uh, process. And I, and, and I have issues with both of these in terms of the Eisenhower Memorial. So, uh, you know, what is, you know, what is a, uh, you know, a great memorial? I mean, what are the memorials that have been judged uh, important and long-lasting? And obviously, um, there's uh, the Lincoln Memorial, which was, uh, done by Bacon in uh, about 1820, and uh, I believe that a great memorial is an exclamation mark. It's not a question mark, it's an exclamation mark. And here, um, and I should say right at the outset, I don't think a great memorial has to be something like the Lincoln Memorial that's got columns and pediments and architraves and the like. I think uh, there are uh, architects working today who could do a great <laughs> memorial. Um, but it gives you this sense of gravity. You walk up these stairs and um, into the darkness, and there you see this great figure of Lincoln, uh, flanked by quotations from uh, his speeches. Or in a very different vein, uh, Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam Memorial. I mean, this was a very controversial memorial. Uh, when it was done because it was the first memorial really that wasn't a kind of triumphal memorial. It's this sort of gash. You've probably all seen it. You see yourself reflected in it. Um, but a very successful and I think very moving memorial. And if you go to any of these really great memorials, you do see how people are, are, are moved. And I think this all dates back to, let's see how that looks on this, to the, I think, Probably my idea of the greatest memorial was Lutchen's um, memorial, First World War Memorial, the Cenotaph, uh, which is in Whitehall, uh, which was built in plaster originally, um, commissioned by the War Cabinet, and included David Lord George and Churchill, to commemorate the march uh, through London by the troops uh, at the signing of the Versailles Treaty in 1919. The plaster version was so immediately um, sort of overwhelmed by, by people. There were uh, flowers piled halfway up of it. It was that they decided that they would turn it into the 
permanent memorial and every day in Remembrance Day, this is where the Queen comes and there's still a march passed by civilians and it is like the Maya Lin Memorial, it's a kind of Rorschach blot. You project your own, your own feelings on it, there's almost no inscription, to the glorious dead. Um, so th those are my ideas of what really great and lasting memorials are. Of course, there are many, there are, there are many others. Um, so now we, you know, turn to the Eisenhower Memorial. And here I just show you, this is not a common picture of Ike, Ike after he left the presidency in, at Normandy Cemetery. And um, <coughs> if you want to see, I think for me, what Ike was like, the kind of the humility and modesty uh, of the man, you know, when he left the presidency, he wanted to be called General Eisenhower. His burial chapel from which this inscription comes is very small. He was buried in his army tunic. But the best way to really see what Ike was like is go visit his house in Gettysburg. And um, it's a st almost a typical suburban house of the 50s and, and 60s with the TV trays that they, he and Mamie watched TV on, a tiny little study, lots of tchotchkes all around. Uh, Ike, Ike was a modest man. He came from really very poor family in Abilene. His house was on the wrong side of the track. So modesty and humility <coughs> and great accomplishment, I think, are uh, part of his um, character and his memory. And, you know, it's, it's, this is the Guildhall's speech. It says, humanity must always be the portion of any man who receives a claim earned in the blood of his followers and sacrifices of his friends. So, the architect chosen to um, design, and I'll talk about the process of this, is Frank Gehry. And um, this is Frank um, during a uh, news conference, uh, which he gave in Spain in 2014. Um, when he was asked about whether he, he, his buildings were really just kind of spectacles, and he replied, in this world we are living in, 98% of everything that is built and designed today is pure shit. There is no sense of design, no respect for humanity or anything else. He added pleadingly, once in a while, however, a group of people do something special. Very few, but God, leave us alone. So that gives you some idea. I mean, Frank Gehry is an architect um, of destruction, of, <coughs> of uh, disorientation. And this, to me, is a, the best example of this. Um, this is uh, in Las Vegas. It's the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. <laughs> I don't think I need to say anything more, but I mean, can you imagine uh, approaching this? And this is, this, this is scary. I mean, if you didn't have problems, you would after you got in there. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the design that Gary has proposed. Um, first of all, the cost, uh, the, the Initial estimate is for $150 million. That will not stand, of course. With everything Gary does, there are many, many dollars of cost uh, overrun. I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more. About, a, about $40 million has already been spent on this monument, and not one um, shovel full of earth has been turned. And here's the plan for the memorial, I mean the space. And um, this is uh, Washington. It is uh, sort of technically not on the mall, but it is treated for um, legislative purposes and uh, commission purposes as being on the mall. A is the uh, uh, Aerospace Museum. Uh, Maryland Avenue now intersects that, um, that space. And so the space for the Gary Memorial uh, for the Ike Memorial is outlined in red, and it's four acres. So you could see you could fit the Jefferson, the Washington, and the Lincoln Memorial in this space. It's enormous. Um, so the legislation 
for the memorial was passed in 1999 by two very powerful senators. I mean, really, um, uh, in a way, who was a Medal of Honor winner, and Stevens, both World War II veterans. Um, and the legislation is very skimpy. It just says they'll build a memorial, there'll be a commission, um, they'd outline the commission members, who the commission members will be, um, but not, mu not much else. Uh, so it was started in 1999. Uh, it currently has a staff of 10 people uh, who are making a million, the staff's expenses are a million dollars a year. This has been going on since about 2001 or 2002. They have K Street offices. They have also an architect on staff. And just three years ago, their expenses were cut in half. Their operating expenses were cut in half from $2 million to $1 million. So there, there, there's been a, just an enormous <coughs> amount of money just spent uh, on staff. So 1999 was the legislation. The design process <coughs> began in 2006. In 2009, they came up with a short list. Um, and uh, 2014, um, it was approved by the National Capital Planning Commission 2015 by the Commission on Fine Arts. Um, I will talk more about that process in a minute. So here is the memorial. Now, it's very different to get a, f to get a fix on the memorial because the only way, the only source for obviously for the, the drawings and the schematics of the memorial come from Gary's office in, in Los Angeles. And those are kind of bespoke um, uh, drawings. They show you what they want to show you. So I don't even have the latest iteration of this. But this is one of the, this is the penultimate uh, iteration. So here's aerospace. This is the Department of Education, the LBJ building, which is a really god-awful, not even brutalist, I wouldn't even characterize that. Uh, and Gary's plan was to have these um, six columns. Now each of these columns is eight stories. Okay? And this was his nod to the um, columns that occupy so much uh, of the rest of the mall. He called, and then between these columns, you can see them here, they're hard to see, are um, woven aluminum tapestries. And I'll show you one of those in a minute. <coughs> Um, and his idea was that it's going to be an enclosed sort of uh, temple. Now, this plan was submitted to the National Capital Planning Commission, which has to okay this, um, as they do everything in the monumental Corin on the mall. And they rejected this. And he came back in order to satisfy them, because they rejected it not because of the design, because of the sight lines, which lead up to the Capitol, um, which is this way. And what Gary did, I can't show you this. What he did is he eliminated these two <coughs> columns. Um, now, he, there, there, there's, a, there's kind of a scale right there of people. And he uh, just left these two columns out. And so the whole, even his idea of this enclosed urban space or temple fell apart because he was uh, so anxious to get this through that these are just sort of vestigial columns that look like piers that support highway overpasses. And some wag said, well, that's great because maybe that commemorates you know, Eisenhower's Federal Highway uh, <laughs> Project, which is one of the great uh, um, accomplishments of his, of his administration. So that, you have to just picture in your mind what that looks like. Um, here is another drawing. Now, these, uh, this is, these are all tapestries, but you can hardly see exactly what they are in this drawing. And then there's a sculptural core here um, with Ike. Um, this is, represents the administration. Um, and this is the D-Day, you know, the famous photograph, comes from the famous photograph of Ike talking to the paratroopers the, on the eve of uh, D-Day. Uh, and you can see these columns, but you see how you can't really see them. They don't really stick up. This is all very carefully done to sort of fudge the, um, the, the enormous impact 
uh, of the columns. So that's education behind. Those are the screens. The screens are, that screen is 440 feet long. Um, this is one of the, this is a mock-up that was put on the mall of one of the trees that the screens depict. There's been some modification. There's a few leaves here. And these are trees that are supposed to be from Kansas. But these, I don't know what they are, but they grow all over the United States. So they're not specifically um, to Kansas. And this gives you an idea of, this is not from Gary's studio, this is photoshopped, of what the scale is like. Um, and this gives you a view, this again has changed a bit, um, of the columns and looking down what was Maryland Avenue towards uh, the Capitol. Now, the whole thing about this memorial is, it, it is a, it's a question mark. It's not, uh, it's a bunch of stuff. There is no central focus. It's overwhelming uh, in size. Um, it, it is so complex that the Eisenhower Memorial Commission has spending $2.1 million for an e-memorial because you cannot understand what this is. I mean, if you think about the Lincoln or you think about the Vietnam Memorial, think about Lutch and Cenotaph in Whitehall, they're coherent, they make sense, they're elevating or they're moving in some way and um, this, this is not. This is simply a bunch of stuff. Um, with a very highly theoretical, um, you know, basis in, that springs from Gary's mind. I mean, the tapestries, he said, were um, based on tapestries from uh, medieval and Renaissance memorials. He had a, commissioned a, somebody to write a 40-page paper justifying this, which is totally bogus. There's not anything like that at all. Uh, in in the past. So um, it fails, I think, on every um, score as a memorial. It's a mo really, a mem this is a monument to Gary. It's not a memorial to Ike. This is Gary's ego, and Gary is desperate to get this done in Washington. He has nothing in Washington. He made a stab at it at the Cor Corcoran uh, gallery where he's going to put an addition. It was like a, encased in titanium or aluminum, but they couldn't raise the money for it, although it was approved. And there is an Ike, though, and here's Ike, um, way in the back uh, on a wall is a picture of Ike as a young man in Abilene dreaming of his future. So that's the real, um, the core of this, Gary thought of him as, the, Mike says, he was a barefoot boy in, in Abilene dreaming of the future, but it's, it, it's buried and it's, I think it's very inappropriate and it's, it's very badly done. Now, how did this all happen? Um, and this is where I want to get into sort of the more political. Um, so what went wrong? Well, a lot of things. First, the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, as I said, I'm a member. And I'll go through this. The General Service Administration Design Excellent Program, under which this was built. The Portfolio, National Planning, uh, Capital Planning Commission, Commission on Fine Arts <coughs> and Fundraising. So I'll go through each of these. Well, first, here's the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Um, there, there, there are 12 members, four from the Senate, four from the House, and, and four presidential appointees. Um, the, these are all smart people. They're all accomplished people. Uh, not the presidential appointees so much. I mean, the presidential appointees come, um, at least uh, three of them come because they were uh, major donors to the, you know, the uh, administrations that have passed that through. There, there's, there are no term limits uh, on this commission at all, so you, you serve forever, which is a very, very bad idea. Um, but they have almost no experience with architecture or monumental design or the history of memorials or monuments uh, at all. I mean, they're purely political um, appointees. Now, uh, 
the, two of them, or two of them were um, from the um, fr the senators from Kansas, um, but only one remains, uh, Pat uh, Roberts. Um, the um, Jerry Moran, who was from Kansas, resigned from the from the commission, as did Senator Reed. Um, I think they probably had had enough and, and resigned. But everybody else is pretty much uh, the same. So this is, a, this is a commission that really doesn't know much about memorials um, or about Gary. And I think what happened is that um, the, um, I'll come back, I'll have to skip the slide was a combination of these two people. And on the left is uh, Frank Gehry, um, pointing his finger in a different direction, uh, and Rocco Siciliano. Rocco Siciliano is the, was the chairman of the commission, the original chairman appointed by Inouye and Stevens. Um, he was a young aide in the, um, I think the second Eisenhower uh, administration. Um, <laughs> And I think he was um, one of the prime movers of, of this memorial. Uh, but, um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So, I just, th those are the two, uh, th th that's part of the, the, the commission. So the second thing is how these federal buildings get built by GSA. There's something called the GSA Design Excellence Program. And that program encourages modernism. I mean, it, it really discourages a uh, kind of elements from traditional uh, architecture. And that's a whole other story, and I hope someday to, to write on that. The GSA also has a design excellence program. Part of this is um, what is called a percent scheme for sculpture. So when you build a federal building, a certain percent of it, half percent of it or so, is set aside for sculpture or other fine arts decoration. And um, uh, this is also very modernist. It's also stuff that people who work in the buildings that it decorates don't like. Um, but it is, it is a process that really encourages buildings like this, which is the San Francisco uh, federal building, a kind of deconstructive uh, building. And so that's part of it. And so that sort of um, set the ground for the kind of design that Gary does. Now, this was a very unusual competition. You have to have an architectural competition. And so if you look at the um, Mylin competition, it was open to anybody. And I think there were about 1,500 applicants. Or the Martin Luther King Memorial, which is not as successful, had something like 2,500 applicants. They had to use the MCI sta state, uh, stadium or arena in Washington to display them all. But this, under the GSA program, was a very different uh, kettle of fish. What they asked for was not designs. The Vietnam Memorial asked for designs. The Eisenhower Co Memorial Commission asked for architects' portfolios, not designs. And so you got an architect, and you then got the architect, and then the architect furnished the design. So it was a kind of pig in the poke. You didn't really know what you were getting. Um, and further complicating this, Gary and Rocco Siciliano, who's Los Angeles resident, have had a long history together. Um, Rocco was instrumental when he was on the board of the Modern Museum in Los Angeles of hiring Gary as one of Gary's first important commissions. He was on the um, board of the Disney Concert Center when uh, it got the Gary, it gave Gary his commission. And now I was not on the commission at this time, so this is all hearsay. I cannot prove what people are saying, and that is that, that Rocco engineered the commission to Gary. And, but we do know that Rocco, in these early meetings, mentioned Gary several times and said that Gary would be willing to do the building. So the design process is suspect as far as I'm concerned because first of all they didn't call for designs they called for 
art, art, artist portfolios. Two architects were finalists. And then they were, the, these two finalists went before a design jury. And the jury said um, none of the visions expressed the whole essence of Eisenhower. The schemas present, presented were mediocre for such an important <coughs> memorial. And this is Gary they're talking about. Uh, this memorial will be in DC for a very long time, and it's about a, it's about a great man. It may, may be worth the time and expense to have the two best teams do another round of design before deciding between them. So this is what happens when you get an architect portfolio and not a, a design. And so somebody like Maya Lin could not be in this competition. I mean, she would not have had the robust uh, portfolio at that time, you know, for just to, to compete. Um, so I, I think this is a big, big uh, uh, factor in getting, in getting uh, Gary. There, so I, I think the commission itself, and then I think the competition itself, um, were really very flawed. Um, then there, there, it got two approvals when the National Capital Planning a Commission. This is an old commission. It was started around 1900 by uh, a group of people who were very upset about the Victorian development of the mall and its progression. And um, it had a, his first iteration, great architects, McKim, Olmsted, um, uh, very, very fine. But the commission, now the, the National Capital Planning Commission deals with the site and its appro appropriateness, you know, for the overall plan of the mall, which is the McMillan plan. And when the Gary plan came to the commission for the first time. They rejected it because they thought, as I said, those columns interfered with the view shed or sight line down to the Capitol. They didn't really have anything to say about the aesthetics of it. When Gary modified this to make sure that the columns were set back a little bit and slightly thinner, not, not shorter, they approved it. Um, I, was at that, I was at that meeting. I spoke at that meeting. There were a couple of people on this commission who said, wait a minute. We should not do this, you know. Let's send this back to the drawing boards because we don't think this is successful. And there was a motion to do that. And then one of the members of the National Capital Planning Commission is also works for GSA, which is a real conflict of interest. I mean, GSA is sponsoring this and they are facilitating it. And this person said, well, this is not a, a body that deals with aesthetics. It's a body that deals with the appropriateness of this um, commission um, to the Macmillan plan and to our guidelines. So it passed. The next commission it went to, and the one that I really have a beef with, is the Commission on Fine Arts. Now the Commission on Fine Arts is responsible for the um, aesthetic aspect of any memorial. They approved the Martin Luther King uh, Memorial and others, and I think the fix was in. I think that they had decided that the chairman of um, the commission is Rusty Powell, who is the director of the National Gallery. Um, I think that this was going to get approved no matter what. And I'm not going to go into the various meetings, and uh, there was criticism by some of the commission members who are all presidentially appointed, which is Another thing I would fix, um, and I just want to show you. This is the, these are this is a, a maquette by the sculptor, um, who is named Sergei Alanbikov. He was trained at the uh, Moscow Sirikov Academy of Fine Arts, which is a kind of Soviet um, a school of art. Uh, his sculpture has been, he's an American citizen, his sculpture has been acquired by the Russian Academy and the Ministry of Culture. Um, one of his most famous works, I guess, is um, a monumental sculpture of President Haydn Alayev in Baku. Um, and his work is dreadful. I mean, as you can see here, I mean, it is, it's, it's just, 
I can't say anything more. I mean, I think anybody who knows about sculpture, uh, any, or proportions, or the way human beings are supposed to look, um, would not approve. This was, this was approved by the Commission of Fine Arts. So that's another issue. And now there's the co commission of how you get this paid for. Well, in the last three years, there's been opposition in Congress, most, most, mostly in the House. And there has no construction money been appropriated for the last two years. So they can't do anything. And there's a, a, a law called the Federal, Federal Monuments Act, <coughs> which says that you cannot start construction until all the money is in hand. So that's about $150 million. Um, so for the last two years, they haven't gotten any money, and they don't have any money in this year's budget. There's a operating appropriations of $1 million, which I talked about for their staff of 10 full-time uh, people. They hired a fundraising firm, Od Odell Sims. They spent $1.1 million on this firm. That firm raised $450,000. 300,000 was from one donor. Um, Rocco stepped down about a year ago and turned it over to Pat Roberts, senator from Kansas. And Pat Roberts immediately said, we're taking no prisoners, we're getting this done, we don't care what anybody says. Uh, and we're gonna get the money, and he was gonna raise the money from Congress, that did not work at all. And Bob Dole has stepped in. And Bob Dole is now the finance chairman. He's on the advisory commission. There's a big eye advisory commission. Bob Dole has gotten everyone, every ex-president, every ex-secretary of state, living and maybe some of them are not, um, um, to sign on to the advisory commission. And he says, he, he said different things. He said, first of all, Congress needs to give the whole $150 million to complete this project. Um, then he said Ike uh, would not approve of Congress raising money for his own memorial. Um, and then he said he's going to raise all the money himself. And then he said he's going to raise all the money himself. And then he wants Congress to raise the money as well. And then we have the latest fundraising uh, report. And they have raised, <coughs> since he's been on, which is probably nearly a year, it's all very... I'm a commission member, I can't find out how much money has been raised. But it's certainly under five million dollars. Um, and we don't know how much of that money is actual cash in, it's a big difference, and, and pledges. So there's been a lot of opposition. Uh, Congress has opposed it. Um, there's a big 73 re page report by an interior appropriations subcommittee called the Five Star Folly, which details in really excruciating um, detail the what's, what they've done with this money, the 40 million they've spent already. It, it charges them with mismanagement, not malfeasance, but mismanagement. Um, and uh, it, it's pretty damning. Uh, the National Civic Arts Society, which is a group started by a couple of supposedly powerless people in Washington, has mounted a tremendous opposition and has really mobilized people. And, and, and just about everybody else doesn't like it. I like the New Yorker, they said, it has managed to achieve something rare in Washington. In true bipartisan spirit, almost everyone hates it. So right now it's stuck. They have no money for construction. It doesn't look like they will get any more money in the budget for construction. They'll probably get another million dollars to keep the staff going, keep the lights on. Um, I don't think that Dole is gonna be able to raise enough money, but it's a zombie. And the, the question is, how do you kill a zombie? You know, this is the big <coughs> issue. How does, it, how does it go away? Of course, the Eisenhower family is against it. The president's brother was against it, uh, son was against it, Susan Eisenhower is against it, Ann Eisenhower is against it, and they raise their voices. Uh, oh. So, I don't know, I mean, there are a couple of ways that, the, uh, we could talk about this because I'm almost out of time. The whole process is flawed about how these things get done on the mall. One solution that I think is, um, and I'm not saying this is the only solution, 
I mean, what, what people really want for what's now is, and I do, is that there's still probably around $40 million in the Eisenhower Memorial budget for construction money, original appropriation, that they have not used. So what people want is to take that money and, and build something modest in that space. Because you have to use that space, but you never get any other space. Originally, what they should have done, I think everybody agrees, is done a statue or something of like near the World War II Memorial um, instead of this grandiose plan. Because once you've got four acres, you know, you've got to put something in it. Um, but there is a solution. I mean, there's now a World War I um, commission, which was set up about two years ago. And it, it's, it's done the right way. Um, it's in, it's going to be built in this uh, area here. This is not a particularly good slide, but this is basically City Hall. This is the Willard Hotel. <coughs> the White House is here. And this area is called Pershing Park, uh, which is a kind of um, sort of very dilapidated park. The GS, the Park Service has not really kept up with its maintenance like so much else. And so there's a commission and they um, did an open competition in about six months, I think. They had 350 uh, uh, entries. Um, they spent $650,000 on the commission. Um, the total cost for the whole thing is $40 million and they're going to raise it all privately. Just the design process for the Eisenhower Memorial costs $13 million. So this is one way to do it. Um, there are other ways to do it which are simpler, like not letting them build anything at all on the mall, ever. You know. um, so that's where we are. That's the overview. That's one way to go forward. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. As you have that up there, yeah. I, I just was at the Willard, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago or so, and we, my wife and I walked through this space. It, it's awful. That World War One Memorial, I, I don't think even Gary could do worse than that. Uh, <coughs> the so, original, the one that's there now. Yeah, yeah. the one that's there now. So what are they going to do with that? To, why do you think this is a, a good solution? Well, they're going to have to keep that, I think. Um, and um, I don't think they can move it. I don't know how they're going to incorporate it in, in, into it. It's, you know, it's got this, um, it's kind of got a reflecting pool that's all dried up. I think they're just going to build around it. I don't think there's any plans to move it. I don't know. I don't think it's on the National Register. But you know it's Washington. You can't even walk kitty corner through it. No, it, it's, it, it it's, it's awful. It, it, it's sort of an isolated space in the middle of a area where people are walking all the time, and you've got to make these detours around it. Well, um, yeah, they're they're running into some problems. I mean, anything in Washington, you know, is just <coughs> an issue. That the owner of the wheeler doesn't want it. Um, maybe because it'll cut down on the taxi stand there. He's threatening to sue. Um, people want the original refurbished. Um, but I mean, it is a way. And I think the, the chairman of this commission is very, very good. And, uh, he, and, and, and what they tell people when they're selling this is that they've learned how not to do it from the Eisenhower Memorial. Because the Eisenhower Memorial is poisoned um, a lot of plans for building on the mall because it's been so controversial and it's going so long. Now, if you talk to the Eisenhower Memorial staff, they will tell you, well, it's only been, we're only going into the 17th year. It took 44 years to get the R Roosevelt Memorial commissioned, <coughs> which is an example of memorial sprawl. Um, you know, FDR was sitting around with his friends and they said, well, FDR, how do you want to be memorialized? He said, I want a slab the size of this desk in front of the archives, which gives the dates of my administration. And I think in the 60s, his, you know, his cabinet members did that. 
And now, if you go to the Roosevelt Memorial, it's room after room after room after room. I wanted room. to know your opinion of that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's an abomination. Yeah, it too. is. And you agree. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely. Hugh Laburn. Yeah. So um, it seems to me you have three basic critiques of the Eisenhower Memorial. There's an aesthetic judgment against it, a kind of political judgment against it that's a bureaucratic mess and all that. And those seem pretty persuasive to me. And you have this third argument, which is a moral critique of Gary and Siciliano. And I wanted to ask you about that third case, the, the moral critique, because it raises this broad question to me of how to think about the relationship between the artist of a memorial and the person being memorialized by it. Um, and that reminded me of this, this letter that I really like that Cicero wrote to a historian in the 50s, uh, Lucius Lucaeus, where he says that the historian should write a history about him, Cicero, and how great his consulship was. And he says he should, he should do that for three reasons, uh, among others. Um, first, it would be really good for Cicero, right, because he'd get a lot of glory from it. And, he, and if, he, if the historian did it fast, he'd get to enjoy his glory while he's still alive, right? The second is it would be good for the historian, Lucaeus, uh, because he would get to write about this August theme. And he says, you know, like, the Iliad is, is glorious both for Achilles and for Homer, right? So you should write it. And the third thing is it would be good for Cicero because Lucaeus was a well-known historian. And the fact that a well-known historian wrote this history about Cicero would bring even more glory to Cicero, right? So I was thinking about that in connection with Gary. I mean, should we be surprised that artists are arrogant and vain, you know, even when they're approaching something like Memorial? First, and secondly, with Siciliano. I mean, this is a guy with a personal connection to Eisenhower. I imagine, if you're giving him the benefit of the doubt, you'd say that he's trying to increase the otter that goes to Eisenhower by having a very prominent, well-respected uh, architect to do the memorial. Um, is that right? Or what do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the architects do have that tendency, especially our star architects like Gary. I mean, what they build is about themselves. I mean, yeah, Gary built this, uh, I think, I don't know if it's the tallest condo building, condo apartment building in New York, and it's not, it used to be called the Beekman Towers. Towers. Now it's ca called New York by Gary. <laughs> it's a commodity. Um, and it, it is sold by Gary. I mean, Gary is the principal selling point. So I think architects really want to do that, but I think it's a job of uh, commissioners or patrons really to kind of rein that in. And um, Gary is a kind of bad boy of architecture. I mean, he's um, his his major, I, I would say, claim of him is disruption. He says, you know, life is chaotic, chaotic um, and uh, architecture to reflect that. Except, I, I was saying, you know, if this was in 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 Los Angeles, there wouldn't be not, there would not be a memorial to Ike in Los Angeles. But let's say it was to somebody else. Um, this would have probably gone through. But in Washington, with the mall, and with the whole political process, um, it, it, it was stopped. And I think that Gary really felt that Eisenhower, you know, um, in a way needed to be cut down to size. I mean, that he doesn't, I, you know, believe, uh, you know, like many people <coughs> do, in, in this kind of um, historic memorialization. So I think that all I think that all came together, and what I think what happened was the, the following: the the commission met. The commission, it's amazing. The commission has only met about four times in all these years, and the big meeting was when Gary presented the design. And I think how Gary sells these things is that. You buy onto Gary Project, you show something about your cultural cred uh, credibility, you know. And I mean, the, some of these senators and representatives didn't want to be seen as, you know, gap tooth knuckle draggers, right? Um, who uh, were stuck in some, you know, <coughs> older age. And I think this is how they they sold us. To them, you know, you will sh you will show, you know, your your cultural, um, you know, credentials, and you will um, by doing this. And you know, Gary's the architect of today and the future, 
and I, got, I think that's how they got them to sign it. But the, you know, that very calculative process that you talked about with moralization, I don't think anything like that happened at all. Um, there weren't any real historians, you know, brought into this. There's an advisory council of historians. And the other problem that they made, well, that happened here, is once they got the design, and even before they got the design, it was the most undemocratic thing you could imagine. They were just going to do it, right? They didn't care about what anybody said. I went into, I talked to Pat Roberts. He's going to get it done. You know, I, six months ago I talked to his chief of staff and I said, you know, it looks like this may not actually get done. You know, where, the, I don't think the Hill is going to give it any money. And um, I don't think you're going to be able to raise the money privately. And so what's plan B? Because if it doesn't get built, if it doesn't get funded, there will be zero appetite ever for an Eisenhower Memorial in this city. We have no plan B. So they've been completely impervious to their, to very reasoned criticism. I mean, there's never really been sustained opportunity for, for critics to try to influence in any way this memorial. And I mean, the, the whole thing is totally undemocratic. How do, you know, 12 members of the commission, um, four presidential appointees, and then four senators and four representatives get to build this memorial for the American people that once it's there, it will be there uh, forever. And you know, Ike is, is fading from memory. I'd say faded. And what are people going to think in a hundred years when they go and look at this thing? It's very interesting what you say about <clears throat> the dynamic that people are trying to show that they know about architecture. So they go with the famous architect. And you see a lot of that around here, too. When they decide to make a building, everyone's trying to show how much they know about architecture. But in another way, it shows that they don't have any confidence in their own judgment. Right, exactly. Right? Because they're going, to, they're going to bow down before the architect. They, they don't want to see 1,500 drawings, which would, that would really test their knowledge of right. their taste and their knowledge and their, <clears throat> their sense of context and all that kind of thing. And it, it strikes me that this must have been, this, what was it about the process for the Viet? I love the Vietnam War. I think it's a great, you know, it expresses what I think about, about the Vietnam War partly, but also um, I think it's generally widely admired, admired that building. But that was done but on a contest basis. Right. She was an unknown. And the woman who won was in, in totally Yale Architecture School or yeah, something. Totally like that. unknown. So what is it? What was it about that? And what ha what were the difference in the process that led to the different results? I guess that's what I want to say. Well, I think the books were cooked. That's my person. I don't can't prove it as I say. The books were cooked for Gary. I mean, I think yeah. that they wanted to limit the competition. I think they had forty entries. They, there were two semi-finalists. Yeah. One slightly better than Gary, I think. Uh, Chicago, I think Chicago architect. Um, and then they had this jury that said, look, we don't think either of those are good. They disregarded the jury. Yeah. But I, I think it was very, I think, I think it was set up from the beginning to, to get Gary. I mean, most people don't even know the name of the architects of the major monuments, right? Right. Um, they, they might know the sculpture, so sculptors tend to be more famous. Like, you know, most people know the Farragut monuments by St. Gaudens, right. but they don't know that the base is by Stanford White is a great architect. Yeah. And you can say the same thing in Lincoln Memorial. I, I couldn't remember the name of the architect there. B Bacon. Yeah, but um, so all of a sudden now we have to have a, a famous architect. And you think it's just, you think it's just uh, cooking the books. It's not any kind of cultural indicator of where we where we are in these kind of processes. Well, I also think Frank Gehry, no matter what he would say, is the establishment architect now. Yeah. I mean, uh, he is sure. like a McKim, Mead, and White. You know, I mean, not really, but um, if, if, if you want, his also buildings are also trademarks. They're logos, and the, the people like that very much about it because, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a Disney trademark or it's a Louis Vuitton trademark, 
or or whatever and well he's still some dizzy still existing right yeah 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 oh. i just had a question of clarification on that paragraph where they were saying these this doesn't represent eisenhower and we're calling for more they, they called for designs, but they didn't get designs in the first place, right? They no, but these were the two designs. These these were that was just on the two designs I see. that they had that they had picked. Then there's a jury then that looks at the design and makes recommendations to the commission. Okay, and then why four acres? Why the why so big to start with? Why, why did this monument have to be four acres? They wanted it big. I think I just they they just what they wanted. They looked around for a few sites. I mean, one of the sites they wanted was. Um, right back here across 14th Street, Independent, uh, Independence Plaza, which is across from City Hall. Um, and they looked at a couple of other sites uh, as well, but they wanted this site, and, and, and that's also part of the master plan for the redevelopment of Southeast, and so that's another issue with it. Um, but it was big enough, and, and once they got it that big, then they had to fill it up, and then that's where Gary came in. Lewis. What do you think the primary reason for building a memorial should be? Because it seems to me that in the case of the Eisenhower Memorial, you could say the primary reason should be honoring Eisenhower's memory, or you could say the primary reason should be inspiring people in the future to emulate Eisenhower. I think it's both. And it seems to me that yeah. whichever one you weighted more, I don't know which one you should weight more, but whichever one you weighted more might make a difference in your receptivity to wilder designs. I don't right. know if Gary's design is the one that we should pick, but, but something wilder might become um, the better option if you thought the goal was inspiring people of the future. So I'm curious to hear how you yeah. weight I think they should be both. I mean, well, it all depends. I mean, a war memorial is different. Yeah. But I think a presidential memorial, a memorial to a person, should be to emphasize his or her, you know, contribution or greatness, but also inspiring. And so that's what I think about this. I mean, you know, you get some school kids coming to the to the Gary Memorial. I call it the Gary. What are they going to make of this? You know, I mean, it's just a bunch of stuff. Little little figure of Ike, you know as a boy, but I think it could be done by a modernist. I, I, the, the problem is that some of the opponents really opened themselves up, like the National Civic Arts Society, because they said it had to be classical. And I don't think it has to be classical. Um, you know, I mean, you wouldn't want to build an, uh, an airport in the classical style. Well, because that's that's inappropriate. So I, I think they're, they're I don't know who could do it, but I I not of the you know columns and architraves and marble uh, school only. Well, one thing that seemed well that you only touched upon slightly at the beginning was uh, what qualities of Eisenhower should be memorialized. You emphasized his humility. You later said in the question period that he's on the verge of being almost forgotten. And it sounds as though the memorial, the driving force behind it were certain people from his administration, less any you know, public request to memorialize him. So that's a deeper question is why? You know, why 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 should you have a memorial to Ike? You know. On, on the mall, um, rather than some other president. You know? There are not many presidential memorials, by the way, in Washington. It's very interesting. There's Lincoln um, and Jefferson. There's one president buried in Washington. Um, or two, I think. Taft. I'm not sure Taft is, but Wilson is in the cathedral. And then there's a, a memorial to James Buchanan, which is in, in Meridian Park. It was moved there and completely overgrown um, and vandalized. Not because people who knew who he was, but just because <laughs> they vandalized it. So that is a deeper question. I mean, isn't there one to Teddy Roosevelt on Roosevelt Ro Island? Roosevelt Island, yeah, Paul Manship. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. But um, 
I, you know, I think that why that why Eisenhower? Because I think, uh, in a way, who served with him, Stevens didn't. Stephen was in the Pacific Theater, and um, uh, and Rocco thought that there should be a memorial to him. They worked a political process. They got legislation. If those guys were alive today, if Stevenson, uh, if Stevens and Inouye were alive today, this would have been long finished. No question, they would have got appropriation. They would have finished. But they both died, and in a way, sort of repented towards the end. But isn't there then a link between them not really knowing why they should have a memorial or what qualities should be commemorated, and this choice of a celebrity architect who's the wrong person for this memorial as well as other memorials. Yeah, that's a, that's, yeah I agree. I mean, what I just think that um, they wanted him memorialized because, and that was the sort of still the end of the World War II, that they, they thought there should be a memorial, you know. There is a World War II memorial, you know, there is one there, but I think that they just decided that we want one, you know, in a way to my commander in chief and to my president, and 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 it's very interesting because um, towards the end of his life, Ike's son John wrote a, a, a letter to I think it was the commission and maybe to Salazar, who was then Secretary of the Interior, saying, you know, this is not my father. This does not represent my my father, and we, the family, do not like it. And and um, I wrote a piece on this, and 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 basically Rocco says I know better than anybody what I would have wanted. He channeled like, and so I, I I think this is colossal egos, unknown in Washington, you know, but uh, colossal just the colossal egos that that. But I mean, once they decided they were going to do it, then I think it should be done. I think it should be done right. Uh, Shep. And then Ross. Um, this is a great story about the advantages of gridlock. Right? Sometimes it's better not to get stuff done. Uh, yeah. But um, I think this is a fascinating story. But I've been struck, we were talking about this a little bit last night, how many things on the mall and nearby um, are not very attractive these days. I was uh, The new African-American history museum yeah. is terrible. Quite, quite dreadful. <laughs> um, the, as you pointed out, the Roosevelt Memorial has him sitting in a wheelchair, which was the last thing he would have wanted. Right. Uh, the, the, the Martin Luther King um, statue is really bizarre. So, oh, it's a lot yeah, more. So, so there must be some deeper forces. I mean, the, the Vietnam Memorial is really the exception. Um, so can you say something about the broader context of why there seems to be a decline in the quality? Well, I, I think there are powerful political forces behind all these museums. Um, you know, people lobby the hill. The hill furnishes the money, and they and they get and they get done. But the, I would fault the commission of fine arts. That's my principle. Of course, this isn't so necessarily recent. Remember that they were going to build a great memorial to George Washington, and they were going to have a tower, and then there was going to be this massive cathedral that would go along with the tower, and then Congress wouldn't appropriate the money, but they did get the steeple built, and then they and that's what we have. We got this big, you know, erection there, right? Which, you know, I guess we've come to love it, but, you know, it is a little bit of a monstrosity. But that's, a, that's why the Commemorative Works Act was passed, because they ran out of money. And it was, for years, it was suspended. And then you can see when you look at it, they're two different stones, courses of stones. I mean, halfway in the middle, you couldn't find the original stone anymore. And so they they, they did want this to happen. So that's why the commemorative works it says that you got to have all the money in place um, be, before you could do that. And that's one of the things that's stopping the construction of the Eisenhower Memorial, because without that, they'd probably be building uh, already because they have construction funds. I mean, even if you had 
hundred thousand dollars, you could go down there and you know bulldoze something. And once that started, then you're you're home free. Nobody's going to stop it. Ross Terrell. There's a historian named Kenneth Inglis. I don't know whether you know the name, but he wrote a book that about monuments in Australia, and he was quite surprised at what he found. Now, the case is very different from your excellent analysis, but there's one or two things that are not so different. Inglis uh, was interested in monuments all over the country. He wanted uh, to end up with the idea that the, generations of young Australians could see a glimpse of Australian history by these monuments. But the striking thing was that there were hundreds and uh, none of them were in Canberra and few of them were in big cities like Melbourne and Sydney. In other words, it was a, a project that had occurred, it wasn't a project, but it's a phenomenon that occurred from the grassroots up. And depending on the climate in the different states and the politics and so on, there, he found them all very different. Yeah. But complementary, in a way, for a picture of Australian history. These weren't only, some were more war memorials, but some were triumphs, even sporting triumphs. And, uh, well, it would avoid some of the bureaucratic problems that you right. mentioned in Washington. Right. I'm interested in the commemoration of, of uh, World War I in, in Australia. And uh, Canberra, right, has got the big official, don't they, in the official mm -hmm. war memorial. Um, and it, it's interesting because that war memorial is it, it's more than just the First World War, right? It's about Anzac and it's about, uh, um, you know, um, the emergence of uh, Australia uh, on the national scene, on the international scene, and and the like. I mean, it's very interesting. And there's a, just this show that toured of um, uh, Australian war art, and far and away the best was from the First World War. The official, the official artists. Um, but it's also Anzac Day is one of the the great holidays. Is major is that the major holiday in? in Australia, basically. So it's, it's, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. It's ground up, not top down. And being ground up, there's a diversity yeah. of styles, approaches, themes, point of, points of view. Well, like there is here in, in World War, World War II memorials, when they're not dictated. Now they're, well, I don't want to get into it, but there's another World War I memorial in Kansas City. Which was the not they call it the National Memorial, it's a memorial and museum, which is pretty splendid. So there's another one of these two, and um, this they're not going to call. I don't think the National. They'll call it the World War One Memorial, not the National Memorial. Kansas City is very extensive with all the countries represented. Yeah, yeah, that's a terrific museum. Extraordinary museum and a great building too. Yeah. Uh, Seabelt Greenberg. So I'm interested in the um, some of the material choices that that Gary is um, proposed is you know advocating for. So the columns are they they're concrete that he wants to put yeah, in. Yeah, I think they're concrete. I think they may be aluminum aluminum clad. Okay. And yeah, so with those and the screens, what are like what are the reasons behind those specific like material choices? Like, has he worked with that material before? Is that sort of a signature part of his architectural portfolio? And like, why have trees on the screen versus real trees? Like, what were some of the decisions behind? Yeah, those? well, Gary likes fencing. I mean, his major first major claim to fame was chain link fence. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm serious. Um, he had very. I mean, he discussed it with his shrink. Um, who said it was hostile and it showed his basically hostility and he didn't believe that. Uh, and his first and his house, which really got him on the map, um, I don't know if you know that house, it's, anyway, it's got a huge chain link kind of cage over part of it. So he likes fencing, 
And he consulted with a stage designer on this memorial. And it's more like a scrim. And it's interwoven uh, aluminum tapestry. Part of it is to hide the LBJ building, which is not as bad as the memorial, I think. It's pretty bad. And of course, the, the, the Department of Education didn't want this because they didn't want to be looking out on this scrimp. But it's a major selling point for Kansas because what Gary said was, we're going to show a Kansas landscape. And so there you had the bear trees, which now have a few more leaves on them. So I think part of that was also, you know, sheniographic, and also part of it was political, you know, to, to sell them. The columns, I mean, uh, you know, that's Gary's, his bow to the mall. You know, there's a columnar, you know, forest out there on, on the mall and the Federal Triangle and the like. And he said, well, look, you know, this is my reinterpretation of what's going on in the, on, on the mall, and that, I think, is the reason um, for the columns. Uh, yes, but um, my question is uh, about how Gary uh, interprets uh, not only the, his choice of the materials, but his design in general. Uh, and especially the, how this relates to the f figure of Eisenhower in his view. So has he tried to explain that, uh, to vindicate his choices? Can you tell us not that, more not about that? that? I know because it is difficult sometimes, especially as far as contemporary art is concerned, it's very difficult to understand what the art is, in this case, the the theoretical exactly so you have uh, to understand the background and and uh, uh, it, it would be good to have some explanation about I don't that. think there's a lot of theoretical underpinning I mean he did say it was this urban temple when they had the columns on the scrims on the side he is he said he wanted to show Eisenhower I think he went to Abilene and there's a in a park there's a statue of a young Eisenhower sort of dreaming of the future. I think he saw that. And that was to sort of to be the centerpiece. Um, <coughs> not the Eisenhower. I mean, there are these figurative elements of Eisenhower's president and commander in chief. But the focus of all that is the young Eisenhower sitting on the wall. So I guess it was supposed to be his um, potential. It's pretty modeled, actually. I don't think there's any real rigorous theoretical underpinning. The columns are modern reinterpretation of <coughs> monuments on, on the mall. Um, but I don't think there's any real theoretical that I know of under, underpinning. Thank you. It seems that if uh, D-Day had failed, this would be a good memorial for it. <laughs> well, that, uh, that, 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 um, yeah, so uh, Eisenhower was, was uh, when you think of D-Day, well, he was such a manager himself. So this uh, this is a monument to uh, bureaucratic entrepreneurship, in, in which he that could be true. That which he excelled. Uh, exactly. But, yeah, it's striking that you know, that there that there are people in the in the in this, uh, on the scene or in, in the story who, who sort of can do Donald Trump types. And, and, and by the way, isn't that uh, often true of uh, real estate ventures? That there's always such a maze of commissions and regulation. Right, yeah, that, everything. That it, it takes uh, um, an, an Eisenhower type uh, determination to see it through. Yeah, he could have probably gotten this through, although he wouldn't have wanted to. So it seems to me like there's a little bit of a reaction to Roosevelt Memorial in the Eisenhower Memorial, because Roosevelt Memorial is a big memorial. It has the history of his life, uh, and um, th that's, that's why this is a Republican memorial. That was the Democratic memorial. This has to have a lot of space, so you've got you to get this four acres, because Roosevelt 
got all of that. And Eisenhower's the great Republican. And so, so that it seems to me there's some elements of, well, we've got to have our big memorial. Do you think there's anything to that? Do you yeah, I, I think that was probably part of the original thinking when Inouye and, and Stevens were, you know, thought that that should be big enough to, because everybody thinks that's too big. I mean, that's, that's um, you know, and once you got the site, and the site was one of the major culprits, because once you got the site, then you had to fill it. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that, that's a good point, I think. Well, there is just this monument sprawl. Look at the World War II memorial. It's huge. I mean, Lachin's cenotaph is just, I think, the most successful because it's the most modest in the way. It's the most um, fitting. Um, it's, you know, you, like Vietnam, you project your emotions <coughs> onto it. It's a reflection. And it's the, been the most famous, I think, monument. And they're all over everywhere. They're all over the, um, for you know, British former British colonies. Lutchen's cenotaph was duplicated over and over again in various sizes. Uh, and like he also did the, I think he did the war memorial arch in, uh, in in uh, in in Mumbai uh, as well, and as well as building the whole colonial infrastructure structure. But this is very modest for him. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know what's coming up on the mall next. I, I would just, I would have a moratorium. Nothing else to be built there, ever. But you know, you have such political pressure to build on all the spaces uh, around it. There's gonna be probably a museum of immigration. There's gonna be a, um, uh, and, and, and others coming, a, a women's museum coming, but maybe not on the mall. Uh, so it's, and you know, the mall is all divided up now by sort of race and ethnicity. And, um, very different when it, there was a sort of just a, you know, representation of American history and those people who were thought heroes at that, at that time. And it's very much a reflection of where we are. Right. How did you happen to get appointed to the commission, if you don't mind the question? Well, that's an interesting story. So, um, I can only reveal part of it. Uh, no uh, full disclosure today? No full disclosure. And I was put on the commission because I was an opponent. And there were people who thought that um, there should be some diversity on the commission, and things were going wrong. And so, I think that's basically why I got on. And uh, I, frankly, I was surprised that Obama did appoint me. Um, and I, you know, just to be sort of a thorn in their side. But I am totally ignored. I mean, I cannot get anybody to answer my emails. Um, I write the um, executive director question after question, and sometimes I get an answer. How much money have you raised? I can't tell you. Um, um, I just, I'm, I'm just a sort of minor uh, irritant. There was a, the last meeting they had, which is probably the last meeting they will ever have. Is, the fourth. Uh, yeah, something like the fourth, is when they, um, there was the, the the original plan that they presented was turned by the national down by the National Capital Planning Commission, and Daryl Isa inserted himself in the process. Now, on the Capital Planning Commission, um, by by statute, you have to have a whole bunch of people. The mayor appoints people. They're ex officio members from the various agencies, uh, and there has to be a member from. Um, the House Oversight Committee, and at that time it was, it was Isa, and Isa went and met with Gary, and he had this proposal that what would happen is everything would be stripped away except the sculptural elements, and then the commission was given 
two choices to send forward for the revised plan to the National Capital Planning Commission. And uh, one was the eyes idea, just strip everything away, and one was the full-blown Gary, Gary idea. Now this is all public record, so I, <laughs> I show up. There wasn't a quorum. There was not a quorum. And the vote, they, they sent the ballots out. I thought wrongly, and the ISA uh, idea was defeated, and it was decided that they would go forward with the modified carry, and then, then that was approved. Um, now the member is Jason Chavitz, who actually is an opponent of that. So, but everything is done. I mean, the horse is out of the barn. Every, they've got all the approvals they need. It's just a matter of getting the money. If they can get enough money, then they can start breaking ground. Once they break ground, it'll never, no one will ever be able to stop it. It's curious that the, am I right that the year you were appointed was 2014, and that seems to also be the year that the Congress stopped appropriating funds? Yeah, I don't think it had anything to do with it. <coughs> I'd like to have, I think I was, I may have been actually in, yeah, maybe it was 14, I can't remember. I must have been 14. Yeah, well, there was so much opposition. I mean, there has been a bill in the House to basically start all over again. They have a new competition. And um, that's never gone to a vote. It's the Interior and Related Subcommittees. Rob Bishop uh, is now the, I'm not sure he's still the chairman. There's no support for it really uh, in Congress at all. Um, Democrats, are, it's not a political issue. I mean, I don't, um, I, I don't see anybody taking sides politically. I mean, it's, it's a, a test of wills. It's the people who are mostly neutral in Congress. Um, Roberts is the major proponent. Um, and uh, now he's got Dole. And then everybody else is either against, either neutral or against it. But they have not been able to get construction money at all. So that's a huge signal. They're just saying, and, and, and for the first time last year, there was language in the appropriations bill, the House and the Senate. The House has always got very strong language. It says, um, the Eisenhower family has not been taken into consideration. The setting voices haven't been heard. We recommend a rethink and a, and a new competition. For the first time, the Senate had some critical language saying, you know, we find some serious issues in this. We think there has to be wider consultation before we go forward. And they, 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 they got no money. So what's going on now is basically you have the staff, in this case, street office. I don't know what they're doing, actually, except they're getting a million dollars a year. And everybody's waiting to see what'll happen. But it's every year everybody's waiting to see what'll happen in the budget. I mean, it, as long as they get a Senate appropriation for $1 million to keep the commission going, the staff going, they could go forever. It could go for 44 years, you know? And then people, the, the staff is kind of sinecures, you know? <laughs> They've been going on since 2001 or 2002, and they have a real stake in making sure that the Gary, they're tied at the hip to the Gary design. Are the media cooperative with you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, National Civic Arts Society prepared a 150-page book of just criticism. Um, the, 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 there have been supporters, but they are the kind of sort of elite intellectual critics. Now, it's interesting because in Paul Goldberger's new biography, which is, I mean, laudatory would be really too weak a word. He does say, he doesn't say that the memorial doesn't work, but he says that Gary was very surprised because architects that he respected thought it wasn't any good. And he says, well, it was like Babe Ruth swung and missed. Um, so even he, but um, Philip Kennicott from the Post has been a big proponent uh, of it and um, has attacked me and 
as a troublemaker. And, um, but there isn't much support, and I think that Gary, I think that Gary star is, you know, is is waning. I re I really do. And that. Um, how, how old is he now? Must be 80, 85, I think. 85. He's eighty-five, but he's still going strong. Um, and you know, he's got this cult personality, you know, and, and the like. You know, like a, like every other star architect. He's also very expensive. I mean, architects' buildings, if you sort of cost them out, are you know, kind of twice the size of lesser known architects. Did you say what he got paid for this? He's got about 16 million. Gary always walks away with the money. Okay, that's in his contract. He's already gotten about 16 million. Now, to show you the arrogance of this whole thing, and this was in this was revealed in this five star file report from Congress. They paid Gary for 95% of the construction drawings before the first approval. Well, that's crazy. You know, you have to go through all these federal approvals. And so though that that probably cost about $16 million. It was the same, the same with the Corcoran in, in, in Washington, where I don't know what he got, 12 or something like that. He walks away with it, and Gary says, I'm not taking a cent for this. I'm doing this all pro bono. But it's his company that's doing it all. So, yeah, so he's already, he's already been well compensated. On a light note, if there is a new memorial, I hope they have a portrayal of Eisenhower at his desk picking up the telephone. Why? Because a week or so after he left office, he was in his post-presidential suite, getting used to things, and he had a, a visitor come in, and Eisenhower said, uh, Bob, there's something wrong with this phone. Listen to the noise. And Bob listened to the noise, and he said, uh, Ike, that's dial tone. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, you've been well.